Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for attending today's Elevating Voices for Equity. I am Sebastian Byers. I am a program experience manager with the Makers and Mentors Network team at Citizen Schools. Today's topic is creating STEM pathways for BIPOC students. We have a wonderful panel for you today, and I'm excited to introduce them to you. I do have a couple of notes that I wanted to share with you as we kick off our webinar. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to attend this very important conversation and learning series. It is part one of our 21-22 series. You'll be hearing music today by Black Love from Tanya Zadwa Atawanga and Tawanda Chabikwa, courtesy of Castle of Our Skins, an organization celebrating Black artistry through music. From classroom to concert halls, Castles of Our Skins invites exploration into Black heritage and culture, swaddling both using and celebrating figures past and present. Elevating Four Voices for Equity represents Citizen Schools' commitment to learning and engaging community and to hear from BIPOC leaders on important topics like equity and STEM education. We'd like to thank our generous sponsors and supporters for this conversation series. With special recognition to Biogen for presenting the series as well as Viacom CVS. We appreciate your commitment and partnership and support of this important dialogue. Today's event will be a virtual conversation with BIPOC leaders focusing on equity and STEM education. Professionals of color are significantly underrepresented today in today's STEM fields, which begins with STEM education, access, mentorship, and career pathways. These factors also lead to limitations in social mobility and social capital. Through these conversations, we hope to learn and create actionable recommendations for changing inequities in STEM education. Citizen School supports our students, schools, teachers, and communities with capacity building for deeper student engagement and hands-on experiential learning in schools and community. Citizen Schools is hosting its second cohort of AmeriCorps Vista Maker Fellows placed throughout the country to build capacity to their host sites, utilizing the power of maker-centered learning. During their service year, a fellow participate in a year-long professional development program to launch their careers as community educators and leaders. So without further ado, I would very much like to introduce our panelists today, and I'll begin with Shauna Young. Shauna, would you please introduce yourself? Absolutely. I'm so excited to be here today with you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Sebastian. I'm Shauna Young. I'm the executive director of the Scratch Foundation. Um, I, I would say that uh, three words to describe myself are energetic, my personality, energetic, uh, strategic, and different, really anchoring in, um, in difference and loving being different in every way possible. Thank you so much, Shauna. Dr. Jamie Lantham, would you please step up next? Yes, thank you so much, Sebastian, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jamie Lathan. I am the Dean of Distance Education and Extended Programs at the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics in Durham, North Carolina. I'm currently serving as the Interim Vice Chancellor for Distance Education. I am actually a history teacher, but I love STEM and have worked in uh, STEM camps and STEM summer programs for underrepresented minority students uh, at our school here in Durham and, and have done uh, several STEM things for black and brown students uh, throughout my career. And I guess uh, three words to describe me. Uh, I'm a history humanities person, so I love alliteration. I think empathy, I, I, I'm very empathetic and tend to see things uh, from other people's perspectives as well as my own. I believe uh, in equity uh, for, for sure, uh, equity of opportunities and experiences. And I believe in and I want my work to empower uh, young people and empower people in general to be uh, to be who, who they feel that they've been called to be. So pleasure to be here and I look forward to our discussion today. Thank you so much. 
Um, I'm actually going to be turning over moderating duties to Michelle Ellis, who is able to join us. Uh, Michelle is currently in a classroom, and as we know, classroom connections um, can tend to be a little bit up and down during the day. So we are very much appreciative of Michelle taking time out of her busy teaching day um, to be able to moderate our panel. Michelle, could you hear me? And do you mind introducing yourself and then a panelist from there? Awesome. Um, so I am Michelle Ellis, and I am a teacher at Hunter Huff High School in Gaston County, and I will um, give Elazar Ajayli a chance to introduce themselves. Oh, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for Citizen Schools for hosting such an important conversation around equity. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Alazar. I have the privilege and the honor of being um, the manager for corporate responsibility uh, and kind of leading some of our workshops around ideas of how to educate young people in STEM education here in Massachusetts um, through Biotech Community Lab as well in the past few years. Um, and I guess my three words are passion, uh, community and science. Um, and the reason I picked those three are because uh, those are the three things I'm most passionate about is being passionate itself and community and really making sure we elevate the community through a lot of different efforts and definitely about science. So science is amazing. So we get to talk a lot more about that later today. I have Jessica kind of come up and share a little bit about herself and her words to describe her. Yes, thank you so much, Sebastian. Um, hi, everyone. It's really great to be in community with you all. My name is Jessica Santana. I'm co-founder and chief executive officer of America on Tech. And prior to my work with America on Tech, uh, I was a technologist in the private sector working for really big consultancies. Um, but I'm also a very proud product of New York City public schools, first generation in my family to pursue a degree in technology and then even start working in the industry. So um, much of my personal experience has informed my uh, life's journey and what I'm doing today with America on Tech. And my three words uh, would be that I'm gritty, um, I'm resilient, and I am an advocate. All right, well, thank you, Jessica. All right, <laughs> great. Well, thank you. Well, now we'll start um, with our questions. And the first one is a two part. Uh, what are some of the barriers to BIPOC students taking advanced math and science classes and from participating in enrichment opportunities? And what are some strategies to change this trend? And we'll actually start with Shauna. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, this is relates to a lot of my life's work. Um, and then also, I think I relate to just being a mom of a 15 year old black girl and seeing it from working with kids around our country and then personally as a parent. I think it boils down to uh, one, knowledge of the opportunities. So a lot of times we talk about an opportunity gap. Um, that's true. I think it's knowledge of opportunities. Um, within the classroom, I think even before you get to how you can go to higher level courses in math and science, it's also about expectations that are set of our, of our kids and our children. And um, sometimes you can relate that to the diversity of the educators in the classroom, but sometimes I think it's a, it's a function of the, of the system itself. Um, I've had my daughter get support from um, educators of color and educators who are not of color. And I've had her also not be sort of elevated based on who's in the room with her. Um, I've also seen that with kids around the, our country. So I think one thing I've learned too is the importance of parent advocacy, advocacy in general, anyone who's in touch with young people, but the role of parents. And I used to, it was hard for me to say that because as a former science teacher, I wanted to, to believe that the system was really equitable because in my, my world, I was trying to be equitable. It wasn't until Again, I really leaned into helping my daughter stay on a STEM track where I recognized that until I leaned in as a parent to advocate for her, um, there were gaps and there were less, they, she was not on a pathway that was most challenging for her academic abilities. And that's hard to say as someone who used to run Duke Tip, which is like, you know, focused on gifted and talented kids around our country. Um, but so I would say, one, uh, we need to ensure that 
we're setting expectations for our kids, regardless of the communities they come from, across the board, they're high as much as possible. And we meet them and scaffold them so they can meet those expectations. We have to do everything we can to share access and op opportunities for kids and actively do that. I truly believe that the work we are doing is an active process. Um, if we are not active in getting information and, and resources out to kids, those who have the most access will continue to have that over those who do not. Empower our parents to feel comfortable and advocate for their children, as well as do that for everyone in the educational system, advocating for all, all children, I would say. And then I think we have to ensure that kids feel um, the support and that they feel it's like it's a welcoming place for them to be. When I did the work at MIT and ran the Office of Engineering Outreach Programs, it was really important that as we brought kids around the country to MIT, they saw a cadre of kids who looked like them, who had similar experiences and interests as they had. And that changed their perspective on what they believed they could achieve. They all of a sudden, after a long weekend or online program or six weeks on campus, believe that MIT, the top technical institution in the world, not Massachusetts, not the country, but the world could and would be their home. And that happened in high school. So the work that we are doing is important work um, in every aspect of the way we approach it. We have to be, we have to be um, vigilant um, because I also believe that it's not an opportunity gap. I really believe it's an opportunity embargo. For many of our kids, every aspect of their world was not built for them to be successful. Um, when they go home, if they don't have the same resources, the food, all the things, where they live, all that is, is going to take away possibly or just make it harder for them to be successful. It's not just whether or not they got their math or science homework done that night. And so as an educator, I am in a school that served primarily Black kids. I learned that pretty early um, that I couldn't just assume it's because uh, one of my kids, um, you know, didn't feel like doing their homework that night is why it didn't get done. They may not have had food that night. They may not have had all these other parameters that happened in their lives. So I'm passionate about the work. I'll stop there. But I just think it's it's active. Um, setting high expectations, helping our parents advocate for their children, and in any, way, in any way possible, wherever we exist as educators and advocates, we eliminate barriers and barriers that people don't even know exist. So I do that work right now within the Scratch Foundation. We're looking at our kids having a different experience on the, our platform based on the, the, uh, the, tech, the cost of their technology. If they have a higher power tablet or, um, or a computer, do they have a better experience uh, using Scratch? And if it's inequitable, we have to change that. That takes work. So that's, that's where I, how I feel about how we change and answer this question, this really important question. There we go. Uh, thank you. Uh, I saw Shauna uh, in the chat where uh, opportunity embargo uh, is the, that term, and I think we all resonate with that. And you agreed, especially when earlier you said it was a, a system that we are looking at and finding that, and is a system built for them to be in and to make their way. So thank you very much, Shauna, for that. Uh, we will now move to Alizar. Would you uh, please? So hi everyone. Um, so just to kind of add on to you know your your thought, Shauna, I think um, we've all seen the um, equality versus equity graph, or that that image of the student overlooking the the fence, and you know it's about creating that equity. But uh, and there's just this other layer that always comes to mind, especially when I think about equity and how we can get more students access to STEM enrichment programs and math. And that's really explaining what's going on. It's one thing to demonstrate to students, oh, look, this is what equity looks like, but it's also important to show what the pathway to equity is. The pathway to equity is about making sure the student is resilient wanting to learn more, wanting to actually succeed and get to that particular position. I think sometimes we are constantly um, challenged with the very big question of we should get more students in STEM. We should get more students access to STEM. But do we uh, do but do the students also understand and do the students have the effort and the desire to get there? Because simply sometimes it's the lack of 
you know, parents and family who have not done these things, right? So I recall when I was younger, um, you know, the reason why I became a scientist is because of my own curiosity, uh, my own desire, my own wanting to kind of dig deep into figuring things out. But then if you go backwards in history and you start asking students, why do you want to be a scientist? Oh, my dad is a scientist. Why do you want to be X? Because my mom is this, my dad is that. So when you're looking at BIPOC students, the challenge of why do you want to be a scientist isn't somewhere in their sphere. So how do we create an opportunity for students, not just to create that equity piece, but also to add the additional layer of explaining what that looks like, explaining what a career in science is, and really bringing them to that opportunity, taking them on a field trip to you know, a manufacturing plant, taking them on a trip to actually see MIT's R&D facility for biology, for biochemistry, right? And then showing them what that looks like because their assumption is, oh, we're gonna make, you know, uh, X instead of Y, right? So, and you're always constantly challenged with, oh, we're not actually gonna cure cancer. We're trying to understand this other element and that's gonna take us years. So I think we really need to be able to create those atmospheres where we can say, you know, these are the stepping stones and these are the starting points. So I think it's, it's about really providing the equity question but also saying, look, beyond what you see in front of you. So I, I really want to make sure that we reiterate not just the word equity, but rather uh, making sure that we demonstrate what equity is and really being able to provide that for young people. Fantastic. And I see in the chat where the word de demystify um, is demystify. How, how is it? I, I feel I know where I want to go, but how do I get there? And so Shauna and Alice are both touching on the fact that there needs to be some type of mentorship and modeling. So if you can see it, you can be it. But if I don't see it, what am I going to do? How do I know to make my own path there? So thank you very much, Alizar and Shauna. Uh, we're going to move on to question number two. And this is a, a good um, two-parter as well. Uh, what can we do to inspire and motivate students to see themselves in STEM during their formative years? How do we enhance the pathways for BIPOC students? Okay. And that was our, you actually left off, um, but if you wanted to continue that thought, that would be fantastic. I would be happy to. Um, so uh, as you guys know, we got these questions about a week ago. And one of the things that I kept thinking about is it's about the idea of creating a safe space. Um, you can't really address this question of how do we create an opportunity or how do we get students to feel like they can see themselves in this space. Uh, it's really creating that safe space. And I think at Biogen, what we've done in, in the past 20 years is really create a space for young people to come in and do a hands-on activity through the Biogen Community Lab. So, um, you know, I'm what we've done is we've had students come here, um, do a hands-on activity, go through a series of uh, educational opportunities. And obviously with the pandemic in front of us, we were, you know, we kind of had to be resilient and figure out a way to uh, approach this a little differently, which was more virtual. And I'm sure you guys all understand the whole idea of how to go virtual, but we actually reached more students in our summer programs. But the reality really, the reality that we actually created is creating that safe space for young people. That's kind of the first step. And then the second step is how do we have students uh, kind of constantly being mentored? How do we have students constantly being able to see and reflect on someone that looks like them, someone who is them? I recall back when I was an educator, a student walked over to me and said, you know, I wanna have your job because I was wearing a very spiffy lab coat. I had my safety glasses on and the student turned to me and said, you know, I want your job. And I admire that a lot. And I said, no, no, you don't want my job. I want you to have a better job than me, you know? Um, and then I remember a student of color who also walked over to me one, at one point and said to me, hey, Alizar, um, so what do you do for a living? And I was like demonstrating and teaching a class uh, on how to kind of, uh, you know, use a pipe pad and all this. So you know, it, it was really funny how the student phrased it. What do you do for a living? And I said, I'm doing it, dude. Like, this is me doing my job. Like, I'm actually doing this, and this is what I get paid to do. And the student just couldn't believe it because of the amount of fun I was having with young people. And so it's really about asking that question of how do we, want, how do we one, create that safe space? But then we follow up with um, how do we make our job more desirable? How do we make our uh, space more desirable for students like us to come into it? Knowing that there is rigor, of course there's rigor. I'm inundated with information every day. There's things I have to push aside, but at the same time, really saying that this job and this journey is worth it. 
And I think we, as BIPOC leaders, have that responsibility to the next generation. And that's really being able to demonstrate that the job and the career trajectories that we're taking are successful, but they are difficult. Thank you, Elazar. Looking at uh, that safe space has always been a thing, that safe space to learn and to grow. Um, how do we create that opportunity uh, for our students? And I, I appreciate it, especially as a teacher in the education field now saying, how do we make it more desirable? If this is something that you, you want to go into and that you want to do. So I, that resonated with me. Um, so also, if we could hear from Jessica. Jessica, if you would uh, add on, please. Absolutely. You know, <clears throat> I am a very proud product of New York City Public Schools and I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. And I think in addition for us, uh, in addition to us creating a safe space, I think we need to be honest in that we also need to create a culturally relevant space, right? The ways in which math and science and technology and engineering have been taught right now have not always been as exciting, right? And when I was a young person growing up in Brooklyn, the thing that I cared about was Jay-Z and Beyonce and Kanye and I was thinking about like if I'm learning all of the science like how is it going to get me to be Jay-Z and Beyonce and Nas and all of these amazing people right nothing about the content and the way that it was delivered or presented to me made me feel that this was relevant to the experiences that I was going through as a young person and so I think that we need to find more creative ways um, to engage people in this content in a way that feels culturally relevant um, because a lot of the content in the curriculum materials, while some people have tried to create um, uh, you know, new and innovative ways, like it's still very dry. Um, and if I'm a young person worried about like, you know, the coolest trends and you're talking to me about things that I don't think are relevant to me in the moment, I could absolutely be lost in the process. So I think that one, um, we need to have culturally relevant science, technology, engineering, um, I will say arts uh, and mathematics curriculum to ensure that young people of color have an opportunity to really see themselves as part of this industry. The second thing I'll say, and I want to hone in on it because I know it's pre been previously said, is that I need to see people that look like me in this space. Like there's nothing exciting to me about Bill Nye. You know, I'm pretty sure he's made an a great impact, right? <laughs> like I'm not going to take away what Bill Nye has made um, as a contribution. But what really excites me is my friend, Justin, right? Justin is this really awesome guy from the South side of Chicago, who's creating uh, science communication content online that is accessible to Generation Z. And he is African-American and he is from, you know, places where our students feel like they are from as well. And so I think it's really uplifting people um, who are already in the space, who are doing really amazing things and having our young people really see themselves reflected um, in the leadership of the organization. So who we choose to be speakers, who we choose to be mentors, who we choose to be uh, facilitators of content also matters. Um, and I think maybe the last thing I'll put here in terms of advancing pathways is that, you know, it, it takes decision makers, you know, the ones who are creating these spaces, the ones who are actually like looking at curriculums to also be part of the process and asking themselves whether or not they've been complicit, right? Because so many people who have the dollars, so many people who have, you know, the power to really make change in the communities, like a lot of times they make diversity, equity and inclusion a nice to have versus, the, versus a must have. And if you are the person who is the sole decision maker at your school, or your community-based organization or your institution of higher education who has the power to hire, you know, uh, diverse uh, talent to teach in the classrooms, who has the ability to um, give dollars so that students can, for example, go on field trips, I would imagine that you want to also be able to um, have the level of self-awareness necessary in order to ensure that the practices that you have as the gatekeeper, um, you know, that, that you are also assessing yourself in the process to ensure that you're not complicit in um, the lack of advancement of young people of color into the uh, STEM pathways. And so that was my contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. And, and when you build off Alizar's, that creation of a space, safe space for our students, that familiarity. So being able to be uh, in a culturally relevant space is the safe space for our students. 
Um, so that is definitely appreciated. Thank you both. Uh, we are going to move to our next question. Uh, there is value in having diversity in a field. STEM fields are suffering from lack of pathways of BIPOC students. What can we do to advocate for change in this system of overlooking BIPOC learners? And actually, we're going to start with Jamie, if you would please start first for us. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Michelle. And I, I echo a lot of sentiments of my, of my fellow panelists. I mean, I've, I've really learned a lot. And, and I wanted to snap my fingers so many times at, at some of the things that you've been saying. But I want to I start by saying uh, that, that my, I have two, two grandfathers who are now deceased. Uh, one of my grand, grandfathers, his name was A.B. Lathan. He only got a seventh grade education, uh, but he excelled in metal works and electric wiring and in construction. He actually built the family home that is still standing to this day. And my other grandfather, Gonza Lee Ballard, was illiterate, didn't know how to read or write, but he was one of the best auto, automobile mechanics in his area, and he was a truck driver throughout his professional life. My, my two grandfathers did that without a STEM degree, right? Without any designation of a STEM degree. But I do believe that they were STEM professionals. I think we have to, and I, and I already mentioned I'm a history teacher, but I love STEM. I think we have to like embrace the rich history and experiences of our students. So, you know, echoing some of Jessica's points here of people of color who've, who've always excelled in STEM, whether it was called STEM or not. So I guess my first point in, in sort of opening up and, um, and, and the system so that it's not overlooking BIPOC learners is that we really need to redefine kind of what we mean by STEM and make it more inclusive and expansive, right? So the, work, the audio recording for Jay-Z and Beyonce, cooking, uh, uh, um, that so, so many things can fit into STEM and we need to, as well as working in a lab, right? All of that is STEM. So opening it up, being more inclusive. I also believe like at every level, at every level, whether it's early grades or graduate school, we need the gatekeepers who are there to be held accountable, not to overlook Bi BIPOC learners. I think many times we have this, we wanna blame the students. Oh, there are not enough students in, in this. No, 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 no. And, and Jessica was saying this, at, at, at every single level, there, there are some gatekeepers there. Are they, are they putting money where their mouth is if they truly say that they believe in equity, diversity, and inclusion? Are they supporting the field trips? Are they supporting the internships? How and how, if they're not, how are we holding them accountable? So from kindergarten to graduate school, what are we doing to, to hold those gatekeepers accountable? Uh, thirdly, I think we need to meet students where they are. And we, we meet students where they are by increasing access to STEM content. Now my day job, I'm a history teacher. I also work in distance education. And part of what I do is work it with my school to have, or, or partner with local high schools across our state of North Carolina to offer academically challenging, rigorous video conferencing courses to communities that would not, and schools that would not otherwise have them. And this is not our school saying we have all the answers. This is our school saying we're not, we don't want to hoard kind of um, our resources. We want to sh share them with everyone. And we want to also learn from you all. And so through these partnerships with these local uh, school districts, we're able to offer kind of uh, advanced level courses. And I think and distance education allows us to do that even more. And so meet students where they are through increasing access, right? I think we need to, and Alizar mentioned this already, and, and Shauna mentioned it, I, the mentoring of, of BIPOC students. And we need black and brown STEM professionals uh, we need to bring them, bring them into our schools and into our classrooms as role models. And there needs to be intentional mentoring and, and consistent mentoring, as Alazar said, like throughout their time in K-12 and beyond. 
right? We need to, another thing that I, I've had the opportunity to do for at least the last 10 years or so is run some summer camps for underrepresented minority students in STEM. And one of the ways in which I do that is I establish partnerships with industry professionals and university professionals. My school sits in a, in a place where we're surrounded by uh, Duke University, UNC Chapel Hill, NC State University, North Carolina Central University, and I've established partnerships with them to say, can my students come into your labs? Can my students come into your workspace? And can you give them real world learning experiences, right? Real world learning opportunities. And so it's not just going to get the coffee or filing papers, but these students are doing for one week, doing, doing real lab activities or real activities within the industry or or in the university working with graduate students. So I think we need we can do more of that. Um, and again, the industry and the universities, they say they believe in this, will show show us by doing this work, right? And uh, lastly, I think we need to move away from this, this kind of, again, we, we mentioned it before, but sort of deficit thinking about kind of what our students, again, what our students don't have, but really thinking about what they do have and thinking about these STEM fields in an in a inclusive way so that the, and the gatekeepers need to think that way about all the, um, the awesome talents that our students bring to the table, our BIPOC students bring to the table, and how they are taking and how they can kind of capitalize on those talents and, and take those students to where we know that they can be. And it needs to be not just black and brown professionals. Yes, we are important as, as role models, but it needs to be everybody's, everybody needs to own it. Everybody needs to be committed to seeing these STEM fields become more inclusive and include more BIPOC students. Agree. Thank you so much, Jamie. One of the things you were uh, talking about reminded me of that. Uh, it takes a village, and the village is not just the formal schooling. And a lot of times that's what we think, um, especially hearing your story. So it is our, our corporations, our universities, our schools, our businesses, our nonprofits work all together uh, for that. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, Ms. Jessica, would you like to add on to that, please? <laughs> sure. Um, you know, I think that in um, our country and even in the global context, we have seen lots of advances in science and technology and engineering and math. And I think there is a common misconception that if we were able to advance this far without diversity, then what is my actual incentive to diversify? And in my last seven years of doing work with young people at America on Tech, I can't tell you the number of times that people have asked me whether or not I really think BIPOC students can get trained and get access to high paying technology jobs. Obviously I do because I've dedicated my life to this for seven years, left a whole entire job in the private sector to be able to pull this work off. So the fact that you would even ask that leads me to believe that there is, um, there is, uh, there is a desire for uh, more BIPOC students um, to actually be able to participate in these career pathways. And at the same time, there is an ecosystem but that might not even be ready to receive BIPOC students once they are actually within the doors. And so I think that we need to frame this as this is not diversity for the sake of having diversity. This is diversity for, as this is diversity for the sake of ensuring social and economic justice for young people of color who have all of the talent in the world and oftentimes are let out of rooms of innovation as it relates to science, technology, engineering, and math. And so I think that when it comes to um, you know, your question, Michelle, which is, you know, what can we do to inspire and motivate um, uh, oh no, sorry, what can we do to advocate for change in the system? I think it's one, ensuring that um, we fully understand the, the systematic 
um, institutionalized oppressive systems that have been designed not by people of color, but by others that have historically or routinely left out Black and Latinx students specifically. Um, and two, making sure that um, you know everyone who is in accountable to actually creating an inclusive environment plays a role in doing that and is given the tools and the resources to do that because we put so much onus on students to be resilient and gritty and figure it out and hustle. And we put less emphasis on actually addressing the system that makes them have to hustle and gritty and be gritty in order to get them, to, to get them even inspired. So we might have some of the most talented kids who are super inspired that never is that are never met with the opportunities to engage by default of the zip codes that they live in, by default of the schools that they attend, by default of the social networks that they are a part of. And so I think that for me, when I think about um, you know, the lack of diversity for, you know, the sake of saying that word, uh, when I think about the lack of diversity within STEM, I don't see this as um, a nice to have. I see this as a must have for us to actually realize our full potential as a society, because though people of color have not traditionally been part of STEM fields, it does not mean that you are, that does not mean that you're not losing out on certain things just because you've been able to still see an advancement um, you know, in this industry without us. And I think the last thing I'll say is that even when students of color or just people of color in general have the opportunities to participate and make meaningful contributions, a lot of those things are not even given voice to. You know, Dr. Kizzy Corbett, was a key scientist on the COVID-19 vaccine. That is a black woman whose voice that whose voice we need to be elevating so that we don't have a movie two or two to three decades from now called Hidden Figures that is covering the contributions that she made. We need to be elevating her right now while she is alive and well and is able to actually travel all around the country to talk about this time and how much it informs us. And as much as we have one Kizzy Corbett, we have a lot of black and brown people that are making contributions to the STEM fields, but are sometimes not even given voice. Um, and so that those are the types of people that our young people need to be able to see um, in order to feel like they are there. Um, and I think that is it is on the industries itself um, to address the systems and not put so much responsibility on students and families to overcome um, this challenge. And actually there's one more thing actually, um, and I say students and families always because I think there's also a misconception that parents do not play a critical role um, in helping advance science, technology, engineering, and math in the home. Um, when, you know, when I think about the programs that we run at America on Tech, there is not a student's parent that doesn't get reached out to multiple times throughout the semester and throughout the school year in order to go through orientation on how they can support their students within our program with when they are at home. Um, and the fact that, you know, we say things like, oh, parents don't care or parents are too busy to engage, I feel is extremely problematic because the ways in which we would never say that about our suburban, affluent, high income earning families is the same way that we should not be perpetrate, uh, perpetrating uh, that same kind of culture within our own communities. I'd like to add a little bit to that, Michelle, real quick, and, and just say that I feel like the, the narrative around, I appreciate everything you shared, Jessica, because um, I think about the fact that, you know, imagine if we were not excluded, if we had not been excluded all of these years, where could we be? Um, versus like, oh, we've got so far with all these systems in place. It's just like, where could we have been without all of that happening in, a, in all those junctions where we could have been more equitable and we chose not to, even as recently as now, um, just gives me a lot of pause. And I hate to think of it from an economic sort of play or talk about finances and things like that, but I, it, 
I see that our current structure essentially is creating a lack of innovation. You think we're so innovative, but it's lacking innovation because we don't have, as you've probably seen the, 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 um, the paper talent on the sidelines. We have significant parts of our community and our society are not actively playing a role in how we create and innovate our world. So just, I appreciate everything you shared, Jessica. Um, so Shauna, you know, you know I think, um, but like five years, four years ago, the, the Biogen and the Biogen Foundation did something very unique to address exactly what Jessica, you mentioned, Shauna, and I think what is our biggest concern. And it was actually in partnership with Citizen Schools and five other nonprofit organizations uh, working in Cambridge and Somerville. Now, what we did was really to um, start what was called the STAR Initiative. Uh, and I can definitely share a link in just a little bit that really addresses the questions that we've just been talking about, which is STEM equity, equity for young people. So the initiative started out as an idea in 2017 to really think about how do we elevate science? How do we elevate underrepresented minorities and underrepresented students in this particular space? And what we did was um, we pulled six nonprofits together as industry leaders. So we are industry leaders and, you know, obviously in biotech, but we became industry leaders in education as well through the community lab and found that working with people around our community became a, a, almost like our corporate responsibility, right? So it became part of our responsibility and our response to our community that is really heavily struggling, especially in Cambridge and especially in Somerville. So the way we responded to that was collecting or creating a coalition of nonprofits to support students in the school system. And so through the STAR initiative, so STAR stands for Science, Teacher Support, Access and Readiness. What we did was we invested $10 million over four years to see what we can actually pivot or if we can actually see a shift in the way that we have students, again, successfully grading better, that's one, um, academically. Two, can we actually pull more students of underrepresented communities into these nonprofit organizations for out of school time. And we're surprisingly working with the school districts. I think the school districts have also demonstrated the success of this and you know, citizen schools being one of them along with our other five coalition partners. And I'll be happy to share that report, but you know, it just takes a village always comes into mind, Michelle. I think when you said it, and that was literally gonna be my answer for question four. Um, that we're going to talk about in just a bit, but it does take a village to get here. It takes a village to say, hey, what are other biotech companies doing? Why can't biotech companies jump in on this? Why can't tech companies jump in on this idea? And um, I think it'd be something very interesting that we can continue to talk about as we approach the next question. All right. Actually, we have um, reserved some time to answer audience questions. So we're going to jump into our audience questions um, at this moment. So one of the key things we've heard all the, the panelists speak about is um, the inclusion and just right where you left off Alizar. So our, our question right now is what are some strategies for BIPOC parents, families and neighborhood uh, outreach to outreach to each um, to help empower parents? So I'm gonna summarize that question uh, there. I see, uh, what can we do? What is a suggestion to help uh, parents advocate because I know Shawna you mentioned that earlier and also for collaboration what what can we do what is a suggestion that we can give so and anyone is welcome uh, to jump in and parent are parents aware of the programs in their community I think that's the first question I want to ask you know if you're in Boston uh, if you're in the Boston or in the Massachusetts area we have a lot of programs that are designed for high school students. If your child is over the age of 16, for example, there's a lot of programs that come out of, you know, this, let's start with Biogen first. Um, so Biogen has a summer program that allows students to come to Biogen. And we specifically look for underrepresented minorities and students of color to come into these programs as a priority. And that's simply, again, to push and elevate that direction of making sure BIPOC students have access first. Um, and then the second part of that is, uh, there are other programs in the area, other hospitals and research facilities that do not hold restrictions that we do as a biotech company. So their legal format is a little different. So if you're in high school and you want to do research, MIT, I, I know, has programs that allows young people to do that. Harvard uh, and Harvard Medical School have programs that allow you to do that. And so does Dana-Farber. So are parents aware of the 
number of programs in their community through the hospitals, through if you're in North Carolina, uh, Jamie, I'll even mention Duke has great programs for neurology programs as well. MGH has a program up here in Massachusetts for students who are seeking to have these opportunities. So the first question I want to address or the first question I want to kind of cycle back to the parents is, are parents aware of these opportunities? And if so, I think parents should also do the due diligence of doing that extra research to figure that out. I think what would also be very helpful is to see what each company is doing. I think if you're in an area where you are, you know, there's a high concentration of biotech companies, I think it's important to ask the question of what are they doing in there for the summer? What are they doing for the students? What are they doing for the community? Because most biotech companies want to do that. They want to support their local communities. Um, and I know that we do it here at Biogen. I know MIT does it. I know Harvard. I know Dana-Farber, MGH. They're all kind of uh, a community that does that a lot here in Massachusetts. So I'll kind of put it at that for now. I'll quickly add on to what Alizar said um, in terms of parents being aware. Also, what I found is that some, while parents might be aware, they might not have be aware of like the process of getting their students or getting their children uh, involved, involved or through the door. Sometimes there are barriers uh, like a application or uh, getting recommendations, et cetera. And one of the things that we found to be quite uh, um, helpful for us is to say, okay, here's, here's, here are these opportunities at these universities or industries and can we meet with the entire family? Here's, here's what the application asks you to do. Let, let, can we walk you through how you, can, you would complete this application? And not in a way that's going to insult the intelligence of our families and communities. No way, no way, right? But just being, a, being there as a support to say, hey, yes, here's an opportunity, but here's, here's how you can get through this door. And if you need help with getting through this door, then we are here to support you. And so awareness and then that that next step because of some really barriers that I don't think need to be there are sometimes there. Uh, one of the things we, we talked about in the beginning is how do we um, see ourselves and making sure that BIPOC students uh, know the path that they are going and feel comfortable in that space so one of the audience members asked us, if you could tell us an early memory you had of seeing yourself there, of seeing yourself in STEM. I can share. Um, it's funny because I felt, I, <laughs> I actually, I think about this moment a lot because before there were things like Code Academy and Udemy where you can go online and teach yourself the code. Um, there was blackplanet.com and there was a mihente.com. And on these pages, um, a lot of times they were like these long um, pages full of code that you would basically grab the code, you go back to your blackplanet.com account, and then you're able to like create a nice background and add music and have marquee text. And then that evolved into like, you know, MySpace coding for myself as well. But it was interesting because there was this, um, there was this black woman who always was basically creating these types of coding pages online. And this was like, I wanna say like 03, 04. Um, and when I saw like, I think the, the, I think the link was like blackplanet.com slash Cindy, Cindy's Codes for You. Like I saw like at the bottom of the page, there was like, all rights reserved for Cindy, please give credit to the code wherever it's due. And there was like a picture of Cindy there. And I'm like, oh my God, like that is Cindy. That is so cool. So I think for me, like the earliest memory was like, you know, being a young person in middle school with my first laptop. Well, it was a big white desktop computer. It wasn't even a laptop. I remember like my big desktop computer being online and seeing like, oh, wow, there's a woman named Cindy somewhere in the world who's like created this resource for me to be able to, you know, learn how to code and, um, you know, have my MySpace, lay my MySpace page layout be really, really awesome. Um, and I think that it was important because it was important for me to see that because um, I think that like, you know, when I got into coding, um, you know, the first friend that you have on MySpace is Tom, right? And like, while I thought Tom was great, and I'm pretty sure he's 
doing well now in life. I don't know that like if Tom was the first person that I had to like reflect um, to that I had to say like, you know, was uh, my entry into coding through MySpace, that wasn't it. It was definitely seeing like Cindy's uh, code for you and like seeing her picture saying that like, you know, you must give me credit for my, you know, my code that I'm giving you. Um, and I think it, it speaks to like how someone's, um, you know, imagination can swirl, uh, you know, at a really early age by just default of seeing someone that looks like them um, doing things that they think are also cool. Yeah, I think I would also add, uh, so th thank you for helping me think back on this, but my first chemistry teacher was a black man who was quirky and like, <laughs> but I could do the work. I was like, it was hard, but I could get the work done. Then my physics teacher was a white woman and she was like, I mean, she was out there. She was so smart. And I was just like, oh my gosh. I mean, I knew I could do STEM. I was so excited and I always got energized me in some classes. I was just like, okay, physics is like, it's a little much to major in physics. I can do it, but I don't know if I want to major in it. And fast forward, I ended up being, you know, a chemistry and physical and physics teacher at a predominantly black high school. I think the other thing too, is when I was growing up, I was in a predominantly black high school. And in the honors classes, most of the people and my, my friends there were of color too. So I didn't like, I didn't have that experience where it happens in some um, city or um, in some schools where even if it's predominantly black school or predominantly a uh, school that's serving uh, kids who are black, Hispanic, Native American, when you go into the honors classes, that's where you see the people who are not of color. And so I had that growing up and I think it just really empowered me going on to Howard, which is predominantly black high school, I mean, college for undergrad and majoring in chemistry it's just like by the time I came out I was definitely feeling myself maybe too much but I I did not I, I had a lot of confidence I think about how we create those um, experiences those layers for our kids and when I was running the program at MIT that was a lot of the focus I want you to have so much confidence because when you go out in the real world and you go into STEM fields you are going to have those experiences that nick away your confidence I want you to remember this moment in time at MIT, so you know that you are the best, all of you are, and you should stay in this trajectory of STEM and you can do it, so. I'll add a very funny story for you guys, if that's okay. Um, I knew I was a scientist when I was probably five or six years old. The reason of this is because I was always curious about things. So as a kid, um, you know, my father, would, my father would travel and he'd bring my mother back a gift. And that gift typically was a watch. Um, and so I was uh, in Ethiopia, that's where I grew up. Uh, well, that's where I was born and came here when I was about seven years old. And um, he would bring back a watch. Um, and I remember this story because boy, did I get a whooping after that. So I grabbed this watch and I would put it to my ear at one point and I'd put it down, you know, just happy, okay. I'd walk by it every once in a while. And it was always this curiosity of what makes this clock tick? What makes it tick, right? So that, that first question of why does it do that as a five-year-old was great. Um, and then, you know, some time passes and you still want to know, you know, you have this inkling or this itch that you want to get out of your body because you have this desire to know something. So I picked up that watch, took it to the yard and I just smashed it into pieces. Wanted to know what made that watch tick. Um, and so my mother saw that and obviously the result was very fun and entertaining. I am okay, but uh, it, it was entertaining because I still talk about this as my first time as a scientist, my first time in curiosity. And now that I am uh, kind of a grad student in neuroscience and really trying to understand anatomy and neuroscience and how the entire body system works, you kind of start to think about um, the times where you really enjoyed the passion that you've had for science, the passion you've had for how things work and why things work. And in this process also as a person of color, you fail. You fail through things, you fail through a lot of the challenges. There are things where even if I did fail, I was always excited to bounce back. I was excited to not break my spirit, to say, I'm gonna keep going. You know, there are times where the things were challenging. There were times where, you know, you face obstacles in undergrad and you face obstacles in grad school. And even in these obstacles, you start to kind of build some resilience to really wanting to be better, to get 
to, to, to become uh, the better version of yourself, but to also look back and say, look how far I've come over these years. So that's something I've truly enjoyed uh, seeing myself and being that scientist that I am today. And it all started because of my curiosity and wanting to smash something and open it. Me and that bet now. Um, Jamie, did you get the opportunity? I'm sorry that I didn't want to miss anybody who was closed out. <laughs> uh, no, so as I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a history teacher. And so I, you know, I, I gave the story of my two grandfathers and I, I was able to live long enough to, to met them and knew how brilliant they were. My father was the first in the family to go to college and he went to a historically black college uh, in South Carolina where I grew up and South Carolina State University and I got a degree in civil engineering. And so I saw like, I mean, I, of course, I thought my dad was and I think he still is like a superman superhero. He built things. He fixed cars. He he was he became a civil engineer and, and built bridges and roads. And so I I did. I could see like someone that looked like me and someone who uh, who, who cared for me uh, in in STEM. I, I saw that. And while my brother and I, and it was just the two of us, never went into, uh, did not end up going into a STEM field. I knew it was accessible based on my father's and my grandfather's example. And so um, it's, and, and even my love for humanities now, I'm still kind of tangentially connected by, by the ways in which I sort, uh, support students at STEM now. So yeah, just that, seeing, having my father, Father's example, civil engineer, built bridges and roads was pretty, um, pretty amazing privilege that I had growing up. Well, great. Um, it was great talking to everyone. I, I just want to summarize some of the, the main things that I saw as we go, some takeaways. Uh, remember that this is when we're talking about the diversity and, and BIPOC students, so we don't diversify for diversity's sake. Um, we actually have to look at the purpose in which we are doing the work that we are doing. And also remember that this is a global community effort. It is not just a community effort in the schools and around. It is a global community effort in which we make those collaborations. Change our mindset from deficit view to a demystifying view in which we can help um, as gatekeepers be advocates for our students and mentorship and modeling are key to that. And when we create safe spaces, uh, we create safe spaces that are culturally relevant centered, which respect the student's formal and informal science knowledge and experiences. So thank you for being here, uh, everyone. And thank you, of course, to our panelists as well, uh, as we take this participation as, sorry, as your participation in this event as a step to addressing critical issues, creating STEM pathways for BIPOC students. Again, thanks to our speakers, Alizar, Jamie, Jessica, and Shauna. Please stay with us, everyone, for another half hour. We'll be transitioning to our student panel, which will give you the opportunity to hear directly from students as they reflect on today's discussion. So join us virtually for our next Elevating Voices for Equity event Tuesday, February 15th, 2022, where we explore developing STEM networks for BIPOC social mobility. And lastly, we ask that you please take a moment to share your feedback by filling out our survey. For every response we receive, we will make a $10 donation to Castle of Our Skin to support Black artists. We will be playing young violist Carla David performs the fattening room as we transition to our student panel, which we will start in a few minutes. My amour,
noyenda kuno pagamwe ene andinga kuparu ta iwe utandide chokwadi wakuru anot kandiro kano yenda kuno pagamwe ene kuparu ta iwe usingandide staying with us. My name is Michelle Zamora. I'm going to be moderating for this student panel. The music that you were just listening to is by Juwan Agubumbi, The Fattening Room, performed by Abby Cambronero, courtesy of Castle of Our Skins, an organization celebrating Black artistry through music. So today, everyone, we're going to be reflecting on the um, industry leaders in equity, uh, STEM equity, with our students. Um, and we're going to be reflecting on some of what we heard today. So we talked about um, expanding STEM equity um, for Black and Brown students and um, how we're able to elevate student voices um, and what your experience has been or would like to be in um, a STEM education pathway. So uh, Araya and Lily, if you guys don't mind kind of introducing yourselves, what schools you go to and where you're living. I'll go first. My name is Araya. I am a sophomore attending Hunterhurst High School in Gaston County. Um, hi, my name is, um, well, my full name is Liliana, if I go by Lily. Um, I'm a sophomore as well, attending uh, Independence High School, and that is in California. Awesome. Thanks so much for taking time out of your school day. Um, so basically what we were talking about um, is we had a panel of industry leaders um, really working to expand STEM equity in their communities and talking about ways in which we can do that um, and elevate black and brown voices um, within STEM equity in education and in industry um, and throughout our communities. Um, so maybe you can describe um, something that, that stands out to you as far as how your school or your community has been able to do that or maybe do a little bit better? Yeah, so um, like kind of similar to what Araya was saying, I am, I wanna be like, a, my, like my future career has to do with um, forensics. So um, our school does provide a lot of things like um, STEM wise, I know we have a STEM uh, like education program here and I know that's helped a lot of my friends. And I think it's really important to, uh, include everybody and give everyone an equal opportunity in such a, um, a great program. So yeah, it's really helped a lot of us, especially over here at Independence. Uh, grateful for that. Uh, Araya, do you wanna expand on that maybe? Uh, what your favorite class has been, um, could be STEM educated, STEM related or otherwise? Well, one of my favorite classes is NC Wildlife and Environmental Science. Those, 
really got my attention because it's wildlife and you're going through science and it just really intrigued me with it. Awesome. Um, something I want to touch on quickly is a lot of the panelists talked about their beginnings um, in STEM education and talked about their curiosity. Um, I want to know what kind of sparked your curiosity or because I think that that's something that's really important that really motivates you to continue on with this type of work. Um, you really have to be curious about what you're doing. And do you remember a time when um, that curiosity was really sparked for you? Um, you know, you guys are only sophomores in high school, so I don't expect you to know what you're doing for the rest of your careers, but maybe something that has just really stuck with you. Well, I'll go. Um literally it really sparked last year in in sea wildlife when we were going through the animals of north carolina and i really was like i really like this the animals and getting to know what species they were and it just really sparked and intrigued me um so i'll go next i would say it sparked around seventh grade um it was in uh, citizen schools actually we did um we had like I forgot the name that it was called, but it was like a club that we did. And one of the clubs we had was forensic science. And um, my teacher would always go all out and make us like help us solve the mysteries. And I was like, this is really cool. And I was like, and it's not only is it fascinating to me, but it's helping other people. And I was like, and it's just such a cool industry. And so, yeah, I probably, um, but just like finding everything out and solving things and the science behind it. So I wanna ask, uh, we talked a lot about in the panel, um, having leaders that represent equity and diversity. And I want to know, I know that Araya, your teacher is Michelle Ellis, and I want to know if, um, if that helps you kind of be, stay motivated to know that there are leaders uh, of BIPOC community that inspire you to, you know, can I keep, keep moving forward with what you're doing? Yeah, that really, that really helped out because she knew what it was like some teachers don't know zoology oh it's science because that's all it's on the back of it no she knew what it was so she helped me with it and helped me study with it so I was really grateful for that uh Lily I want to know if you have had that experience as well um being able to see people of color as leaders in your community if that's something that motivates you or that you would like to see more of um so yeah uh Definitely 100%. It helps to see like a very like the diverse community out there, especially helping leading our um, like uh, in the education wise. Um, I don't think I've experienced it, but I know that I've, there's definitely teachers on this campus that have um, and seen that helps you and know like they know what we have to go through and they um, they help us along the way. So yeah. So the next question um, that I want to ask you about is something that would be helpful uh, as you embark on your educational career versus your workplace journey. Um, so basically, like, what type of programs or classes, you know, programs outside, it could be outside of school, um, or classes that you want to take that would kind of continue with that spark in your curiosity and um what what's the next classes you want to take what are the next programs you want to look into in your communities um that will help you move forward with uh esteemed career all right we can start with you volunteering would be volunteering is a big thing with it and helping and just moving with it in particular, do you have any organizations in mind or maybe wonder if, you know, the people in this community and this webinar might have ideas or recommendations for um, programs that might interest you in zoology or environmental science? So a program that I have volunteered at that really helped me is Vita Hope Ranch. Um, it helps with kids with autism and helping out rescue animals and to help with their programs and processing through with their autism and rescue, rescuing new animals and everything. And that really intrigued me to just help and just, just help, yeah. That sounds like an amazing program, I love that. Lily, how about you? 
Um, yeah, um, similar to like what Ryan said is um, volunteer things, like just making them available to um, like everybody. Um, I think it's really important that we get experience before like we get into like actual, uh, I don't know what the word is for it, but like get into it itself. Um, I haven't got to like volunteer for anything that I've like seen I think it's really important be that we get programs into like different schools so we can like sign up because I haven't heard of like anything that is what I want to do yeah so that kind of leads to the next question um what are some of the major or main uh barriers you know challenges in accessing uh, some of these STEM programs or science related, math related, um, art related uh, that you see and how can we start to overcome them as BIPOC leaders in the community and everyone? All right. The major thing is you don't see big leaders like, for example, Michelle Ellis, you don't see big leaders in programs and it's just, we need those. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Um, why it's so important? Um, like leaders that look like us, color people, we don't have big leaders to lead on kids to pursue dreams. And we do need that to just give a little push to just give them that hope to say, you can do this and we need those more in our school system, in our counties. Yeah, thank you. Lily? Um, so yeah, so Ryan has some pretty good answers there too. Um, it is really important, especially us um, being students, it's kind of hard for us to try to lead, even though like as much as we want to, it's important that we have an actual, like a leader, an adult on our campuses and our school programs that are, um, that are of color and we can just look up to them and they um, they have a bigger, um, sorry, I'm having a hard time coming up with words right now, um, a bigger and influence <laughs> on a lot of the students. And it's really important that they encourage a lot of students because I know that would be, have a huge impact when it comes to STEM. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how about in your community? So we talk about um, teachers and um, people in the school systems, but what about, you know, having, what are some barriers or challenges that you see in your community? Um, is it the same problem or what are some, you know, some maybe solutions that we can, we can start to implement that would increase, you know, elevating BIPOC leaders in your, within your community, like outside of school? Outside of school is really the same problem with in our county and everything is the same problem and we just need those leaders to just do that um yeah kind of the same thing um like what the school situation is we we do really just need that one all it takes is that one role model to kind of stand up and show everyone like that we need to encourage people to do it it's, it only takes one person um, thank you both. Um, so let's see, the next question that I want to talk to talk to you about is um, what's one thing that would help you feel more confident in moving towards careers in STEM? A summer job, admission to a great program, support from a teacher or mentor, a scholarship, um, a maker lab. So I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the, what maker space or maker labs are. Um, but yeah, what are, and I can expand on that later if you'd like, but uh, what's one thing that might make you feel more confident about pursuing uh, these types of career paths? As we said, the leaders, like that would help more with um, where our confidence and everything and background knowledge. You just know when you get that background knowledge, you know when you get in this program, oh, this is what we're going to do. And the background knowledge would just help totally with that um yeah um leaders always help um also like um community support is a huge thing that um i know it's just like knowing when you know that you have someone supporting you 
every step of the way like it helps you like okay like I can do this because you know and they think I can do this and I need to prove to them I can do this um so support is a huge thing along with leaders because they they do help you and they teach you and they guide you and they like kind of hold your hand as you are taking on into this career pathway yeah and that's something that we talked about in the the leadership panel um is having strong and consistent mentorship um, I know that that's something that's helped me a lot is having someone, you know, you, you maybe subconsciously want to please them all the time, but because you look up to them, respect them, um, and you have these leaders in your corner, you know, they inspire you to keep going and keep pursuing and, um, and doing what you're good at, you know, doing what you're curious about and learning more, continuously learning, right? Um, so we talked about a lot about like, the leaders um, that would help you, the mentors, but I'm wondering if anything in the curriculum in your schools that we also talked about in the panel, how the curriculum is just not engaging. You know, STEAM education is dry and um, I've worked a lot to help change that, you know, the curriculum and the, and the ways in which we teach students, um, whether it's project-based learning or hands-on learning um do your schools do that and what are ways that they can be doing that better yeah truly if it's more hands-on and more teamwork based and just getting into the projects and getting into the work and working together and getting to know what you're learning that would help out yeah yeah billy how about you um so yeah the same thing um i think it's also it's not just a curriculum. It can also depend on how the teacher decides to teach that curriculum. I know um, this year, my teacher has done a fantastic job of making sure that we work as a team. And, you know, there's some things that we can't always do in a team. We have to like take tests and do a certain assignments on our own. But like even like little things to take breaks to like do a, like a fun activity um, is also important to get all of us re-engaged into what we're learning. Um, so, yeah, it also depends on how the teacher decides to teach it. Cool. Well, thank you so much, ladies, for, for joining our panel. Um, I think I'm going to open it up to the audience and see if anyone has any questions. Hi, right, Michelle, Araya, and Lily. It's uh, Sebastian again. There was actually um, a really cool question that came in, and forgive me, I'm not catching the name right now because I wanted to you know, just manipulate the question a little bit, but Araya, um, the person said you described your experience as STEM was always accessible. Do you think that your school and educational community is doing something different, better than school systems that struggle with accessibility? I believe they're doing, I think they're doing better. Our school system, our STEM system was really good. They were really hands-on and working and we had fun what we did and we learned what happened and what we were learning is not was just come to class and sit and write down notes. We came to class to learn and have fun. Lily, is there something that your school is doing? You described your teachers really kind of going through the curriculum and being a big influence in, in how much you're enjoying your class. But do you feel like your school is is aligned in doing things right? Um, and if like if you could share with the audience like what what makes a good school day or a good school year, or what the schools might be doing? Do you have like Science Olympiad and extracurricular activities? Which are a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, my school, the one I currently go to, they have a, a STEM program. Um, I'm not involved in it. A lot of my friends actually are. And I've heard that it's fantastic, that it provides a lot of opportunities and they have a lot of like things like college-wise that like help us get into colleges for STEM. Um, activities wise, I'm not too sure about what we do. Cause like I said, I'm, I'm not in the STEM program, but I've heard a lot of amazing and positive things about it. And Michelle, if you don't mind, if I could just ask one more question that we actually don't have in the chat, but one I was thinking of, 
how important is it to both of you that what you're learning in school really relates to what you want to do with work? Are you, is that what motivates you? You might've had experience working with an animal or maybe you know someone in pathology. Is there, is there a focus on what comes after school already for you? I know in my classroom, I talk to my students a lot about actual work and we look for any times so we could have folks that are in fields uh, of employment to come talk to my class. So if you don't mind, just share with our audience kind of, you know, thinking about the transition from school to work? Well, what I have learned so far is truly going to help me for what I want to be when I grow up. The, even the small things that we learn, it's going to help me so far for what I'm going to be and what I want to be. Um, yeah, so the same thing. I know that that one club that I did in seventh grade um, will always impact, like it was the start of that interest to me. Um, I also know that my school offers something for my junior and sophomore year, um, and I'm really looking forward to that. And I think it really is a, just the little opportunities and the, the little lessons that um, will always impact. Like, like it's the tiniest, it, all it takes is one person, it takes one lesson to encourage like the kid for the rest of their life. Thank you, Ryan and Lily, again. We appreciate you being here and, you know, expressing your words of wisdom. Uh, I know that I learned a lot from you. And uh, thank you to our audience who came today to the student panel. Um, we'd like to also thank our generous sponsors and supporters of the, the conversation and series with special recognition to Biogen for presenting the series as well as Viacom CBS. And we appreciate your commitment and partnership in support of this important dialogue. Um, Please take a moment to share your feedback by filling out the survey. We'll drop it in the chat. Um, if every for every response you receive, we'll make a ten dollar donation to Castle of Our Skins to support Black artists. The final track that you'll be listening to is by Juwan Agumbi's "The Fattening Room," performed by Abby Cumbranero, courtesy of Castle of Our Skins. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Mm -hmm.